Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for this special conversation. Uh, I'm Brandon Walton, Managing Editor of Texas Scorecard. We're being joined right now with Daniel Miller, a candidate for Lieutenant Governor on the Republican ballot. It's March 1st is the the, uh, the election. Uh, Daniel, thank you so much for coming in. Hey, thanks for the invitation. Uh, so for folks who may not have been paying attention to this race or, or, or even maybe know your background, give folks a little bit of an introduction into who you are. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, as I, as I have said for many years, I'm a sixth generation Texan. Uh, my, my ancestry, I trace all the way back to the Battle of San Jacinto, mm -hmm. fighting alongside Sam Houston. And uh, so fighting against uh, tyranny runs in my DNA. Uh, but uh, I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a uh, technology consultant by trade, have been involved in tech since the 1990s. And uh, most people probably know me as president of the Texas Nationalist Movement. Uh, I've been president and founder for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I wrote a, a book called Texit, Why and How Texas Will Leave the Union, a uh, four-time bestseller on Amazon. So that's where most people probably know me from. Um, so ex explain that, because you definitely have an interesting background with the Texas Nationalist Movement and with Texit. Uh, explain what, what, what all that is, what that entails. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So August 24th, 1996, uh, prior to that, I had been, I, I'm not, I wouldn't claim to be an activist, just an engaged citizen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, really fighting on the issues of uh, the income tax, right to keep and bear arms, uh, but primarily focused around constitutional rights. And, uh, you know, I was, I was frustrated. I, I, I liken it to how people felt after the no November election of President Puddin' Pop, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how they felt uh, really kind of dejected, dis dis uh, discouraged. And <clears throat> it, it, what really happened for me was I was introduced to this idea that Texas could be its own self-governing independent nation. Mm -hmm. And when I was introduced to the idea, it it triggered a memory that I had of a book that I had read a few years previously called Global Paradox by John Nesbitt. Mm -hmm. and, and many people may know that book, uh, you know, or, jo or at least John Nesbitt. He wrote Megatrans, Megatrans 2000, kind of an economic futurist. But in that book, he talked about how uh, the world's trends pointed overwhelmingly toward economic interdependence on one hand because of the telecommunications revolution mm -hmm. and political independence on the other hand. And he cited a statistic that has stuck with me to this day that at the end of World War II, there were 54 recognized, fully sovereign, self-governing countries around the world. And by the end of the 20th century, there were 192. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it was one of those things that it's like, okay, if the federal government, if the sewage is flowing in from the federal government, let's stop it at the border. And we can do that by becoming a self-governing independent nation. So 1996, uh, August 24th, I, I pledged, as I tell people all the time, I pledged to see Texas as a free and independent state or until the grave digger pats me in the face with a shovel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and so that led to the formation of the Texas Nationals Movement in 2005 because there was no real political advocacy group that was trying to advance that issue. And so we went uh, from basically a room with about a half dozen people uh, in, uh, in November of 2005 uh, where Texas was polling in single digits, mm -hmm. which, but, but I tell people that even though it was only polling in single digits, we've always polled higher than the approval rating of the U.S. Congress. Yeah, that's, which that's is, true. <laughs> you know, it was generally polled somewhere like above or below leprosy, right? Mm -hmm. So not, not a high, not a high banner, but we've, we've grown the issue to the point that the Texas Nationals movement outside the two major political parties is the single largest political advocacy organization in the state. And, and now Texas, we, we feel very confident that if Texas were to go on the ballot for the people of Texas to vote on, it would win. So, um, you know, not not a minor accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And there was legislation <laughs> obviously filed during the most recent legislative session to uh, put that referendum to a vote. Ultimately, though, uh, it didn't pass. What, what do you think the problems were there? Oh, there were there were a lot of problems. You know, there's a, a we obviously have a leadership problem. Mm -hmm. You know, we, while the organization is really sort of pigeonholed a lot of times by outsiders as being singularly focused on Texas. We work a broad range of issues. You know, it's uh, if you look at our mission, it's the political, cultural, and economic independence of Texas. So that takes us into fights like, um, you know, the Texas Gold Depository Act several mm -hmm. sessions back, or uh, monument protection. You know, the issues surrounding the Alamo. We fought all of those battles. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that became very apparent to us throughout all of these sessions has been the the lack of leadership. I mean, we have corruption in the legislature. 
and we have a leadership problem in that we have leaders and representatives that don't adhere to the Texas Constitution. Uh, they give li their campaign conservatives. <clears throat> they give lip service to listening to the voice of the people, uh, but when it comes time to deliver, they just don't do it. Right. So uh, when uh, Representative Kyle Biederman agreed to file the Texas Independence Referendum Act, uh, we we noticed some immediate problems. Uh, we saw Ledge Council strip out, change the the question, mm -hmm. which was highly researched based on tons of academic research from uh, independence referenda around the world. Uh, but that was the first sign. But what we saw once Kyle filed that bill was this outpouring of support, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we our people flooded the phones, people that we didn't know. Um, you know, we shut down the switchboards, I don't know how many times at the mm -hmm. Capitol. And when they when constituents would get in touch, with their representative, because that's how we encourage it. So talk to your rep, tell them to sign on. They were being told that they were getting no calls, but secretly they were going to Kyle and complaining about all the phone calls they were mm -hmm. getting that they couldn't get anything done. So, you know, again, liars. And, and it gets down to ultimately the bill was referred to state affairs in the House. Mm -hmm. You had Chris Patty as the chair, and Chris Patty is perhaps one of the worst state reps to ever grace the halls of the Pink Dome. Uh, he, he's part and parcel of the reason that it's referred to as Moscow and the Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's that's ultimately what happened. Word came down from Abbott and Patrick that this bill was not to see the light of day, mm -hmm. and their lieutenants made sure that that was the case. And so that happens during the most recent legislative session, and then you decide you want to run for lieutenant governor. Well, <laughs> let, no, let's not oversell it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so start. So during the process of going out and, and advocating for that legislation, you know, mm -hmm. I, I had been out on on the speaking circuit, talking to grassroots conservative organizations all over the state, mm -hmm. and uh, it, you know, one of the things I always do when I speak is I, I have a Q and A. Any question, mm -hmm. and what what uh, what kept happening was. I kept getting asked if I would run against Dan Patrick, if I would run for lieutenant governor. Now, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, that is weirdly specific. Right. You know, Patrick, you know, with all this angst that people had with the legislature kind of around our issues, um, you know, you would think that they would want me to run against the state rep in my hometown, mm -hmm. which is Dave Phelan. Okay. <laughs> you know, you would think that would be the natural, but mm -hmm. the, the ask was repeatedly Dan <laughs> Patrick. So this continued to happen throughout all of last year, uh, and it really culminated in an open letter signed by a whole slew of, uh, of Republican activists, conservative activists, grassroots organizations, where they specifically asked me to run against Dan Patrick, mm -hmm. specifically related to his, not just his inaction on the Texas issue, but really and truly about the, uh, the lockdowns, people still really sore about mm -hmm. Patrick's role in the lockdowns, uh, his lack of pushback against Greg Abbott from his executive overreach, mm -hmm. and the fact that when the legislative session came in, uh, this particular legislative session, Dan Patrick tried to essentially codify all of the things that Abbott did and retroactively make them legal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there was a lot of angst. And, and with the onslaught coming from the federal government, those individuals and groups don't believe that Dan Patrick is strong enough to stand between the federal overreach and the citizens of Texas. So ultimately, after a lot of consideration, a lot of prayer, a lot of discussion, a lot of strategic planning, um, I, I finally made the decision mm -hmm. to run. Uh, if you were lieutenant governor during, say, uh, the last legislative session or even, even before that, uh, when we were under lockdowns for, for COVID, uh, what would your response have been? How would you have used that office to push back against the governor? Yeah, I mean, look, let's let's look at it, the way things are. When the lockdowns happened, mm -hmm. the legislature was not in session, but but Dan Patrick said nothing, right? So there was nothing legislatively he could do. But the one thing that he could do is open his mouth because the second exec, you know, the the second level executive in Texas, the president of the Senate, the strongest constitutional office in Texas. If he would have just raised his voice and said, this is wrong, this should not be done, it would have carried weight. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. You look at all those press conferences with Greg Abbott talking about shutting down churches, shutting down businesses, throwing business owners in jail, segregating us into essential and non-essential workers. Mm -hmm. And you see on his right, you see Dan Patrick sitting there like a fresh graduate from mime school saying absolutely nothing. 
And and that has been part and parcel of of uh, you know Dan Patrick's tenure. He has become somewhat of a lap dog for. Uh, Greg Abbott. And and it's uh, frankly, it's despicable. When the president of the Senate should act as a check against the executive authority of the governor, he's done nothing. And so you would think that, okay, well, perhaps if he was silent during that time when the legislative session started, he would take some action. But he didn't. You know, he, he actually sought to codify the things that Abbott did under executive orders to make them okay. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, he instituted COVID testing in the Senate. You couldn't testify in front of a Senate committee or go into the Senate gallery without a COVID test, so much so that the Agriculture Commissioner had to sue him. Mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, we're, we're looking at a situation where you've got a lieutenant governor who is not taking care of business. And, and if I were in that position, number one, during the lockdowns, I would not have jumped on the Abbott bandwagon. Mm-hmm. We know that the data that was that predicted the apocalypse. I mean, if, if you go back to the original Imperial College report that got zero scrutiny from the Texas government before they implemented the lockdowns, we know that that has been proven to be absolute garbage, so much so that Neil Ferguson has been fired mm-hmm. from Imperial College uh, for actually violating the UK's lockdown to cheat on his wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we know that it's been proven to be garbage. So the, we know the projections were wrong. We know that the overreach was wrong. Uh, but, you know, again, I, I would have at least said, OK, look, we need to take a beat. We need to look at the numbers. We need to vet this out before we upend everyone's lives. Uh, but there, there would have been no lockdowns. The, the people need to, to make, be able to make their choices and there would have been pushback against Abbott. But absolutely, when the legislative session started, it would have been time to start stripping uh, provisions out of the emergency powers that the governor has mm-hmm. uh, and start uh, jerking his chain to, to put him back in his box. We don't have autocrats in Texas. Mm-hmm. I think when you look at uh, when you look at the Republican Party of Texas's priorities, for example, uh, you see a number of those priorities where the House especially mm-hmm. has opposed them. And so if you're lieutenant governor, right, you're, can, you can control the Senate. But, but what do you do when those same items hit a wall in the House? I'm thinking specifically right off the top of my head of child gender mutilation, right, yeah. where we, we saw that that was never brought for a vote, uh, um, fixing the election integrity bill, other, other issues like that. What, what do you do? Well, you know, let, there's a reason that the lieutenant governor is called the most powerful constitutional office in Texas, and mm-hmm. it's because he controls the flow in the Senate. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that they have a priority, they have an issue with establishing priorities mm-hmm. and capitulating to the House, while the House is fiddling away and giving us bills on making San Marcos the mermaid capital of Texas, mm-hmm. or, you know, Andy Murr's mustache being the official mustache of the Not House of joke. Representatives. A, a real, that, a real that literally happened. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that literally happened. And so when they say they run out of time, this is a priorities issue. So a, a real Republican lieutenant governor, n- number one, I mean, the three litmus tests that, mm-hmm. that I lay out is number one, do they, fo- do they know and follow the Constitution? Number two, do they do what they say they're going to do? And number three, do they do what they're supposed to do? Mm-hmm. And and when you talk about the Republican legislative priorities, the lieutenant governor could literally grind the legislature to a halt until those priorities are done. Say, hey, guys in the House, you, you want to have a, you, you know, you want to declare Andy Murr's mustache if you think it's that great? Mm-hmm. Guess what? Well, as soon as we get these priorities done 100 percent, then we'll deal with naming roads and, you know, talking about Andy's mustache <laughs> and, you know, talking about, Do- you know, Dr. Pepper and mermaids and all those things. Mm-hmm. But until that's done, nothing moves. Mm-hmm. Uh, border security, right? That's become a big, big <clears throat> focus, especially over the last uh, year since Biden's been in office. Uh, what else can the state of Texas, in your estimation, be doing to fight back against the invasion on our southern border? Well, you hit the nail on the head. It's an invasion. Right. My first trip down to the border to provide relief to ranchers was in 2001. That's how far back this problem goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I can remember being down there on a border relief mission and being scoped in from across the border. Right. So th- this has been a, a problem. And, and you look at the polling, right? Mm-hmm. For the last 15 years consistently, third party polling has shown that the border and immigration combined are the number one concern for Texas voters. But yet there has been no subsequent, there's been no substantial action on the part of the state of Texas. And, and part of it is that they don't want to recognize it as an invasion, right? Mm-hmm. They don't want to do that. But 
June 6, 1944, 160,000 Allied troops hit the beaches of Normandy in the largest amphibious invasion in modern history. But we have 160,000 illegal immigrants cross the border in Texas every single solitary month. Mm -hmm. Now, they will call it a public health crisis. They'll call it a public safety crisis. They'll call it a national security crisis. But they will not call it or and treat it what it, as what it actually is, and that's an invasion. So, you know, the, the fact is, is that the governor has the ability, the authority, constitutionally to declare it as such and treat it as such by deploying troops on the border. The challenge that we have had is that, frankly, Abbott's border plan, the Abbott-Patrick border plan, is, is Chupacabra, right? Mm -hmm. They should call it Project Chupacabra. And the fact that there are a lot of people that think that it exists, it's pretty scary based off its description, but it doesn't actually exist, right? That's Abbott's border plan. And, and so, you know, what, what we have proposed is probably one of the most aggressive border security plans that needs to be done legislatively. Uh, and that is, instead of giving that $2 billion in the biennium to the DPS to run traffic patrols 30 miles mm -hmm. from the border, what we do is we shift those, that, that money and those assets over to the Texas State Guard, fully militarize them, open enlistment, and, you know, open it wide open, and deploy them right up to the river to interdict and turn back anyone who tries to cross. Uh, we can absolutely 100% secure the border. The State Guard is the mechanism under the Texas Military Department as opposed to the National Guard mm -hmm. because the State Guard cannot be federalized. As it stands right now, when Abbott deploys the National Guard down there, if he were to, you know, I would say put a substantial surge of National Guard, Biden can, with a stroke of a pen, federalize National Guard and send them all back to the House. But he can't do it with the State Guard. So that's the mechanism. And mm -hmm. that, that plan was first proposed by, by our organization in 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, another question on policy here. Property taxes in Texas are some of the worst of any state. Um, efforts to reform property taxes have not really resulted in any sort of reduction in the average taxpayer's bill. What would you do? Straightforward, okay? And, and we got to get this out of the, uh, on the table immediately. Mm -hmm. The property tax is immoral. It is immoral for the government to charge people rent for property that they own, okay? And when you have an immoral practice, you don't reform it, you don't fix it, you eliminate it, okay? Mm -hmm. And so if the property tax is immoral, elimination has to be the ultimate goal. It has to go away. And the question is, what do we do instead of a property tax? Because it could leave a revenue hole. Well, the good news is, is that since 2013, there have been multiple plans presented to the legislature that would essentially end in the elimination of the property tax. Mm -hmm. But the lieutenant governor has not moved on any of them. 2013, George Lavender in the House introduced a bill uh, that would have that would have gutted the entire tax system and replaced it with a consumption tax. Mm -hmm. uh, you had in this session, you had the Texas Public Policy Foundation uh, put together a, a three-part plan that would have led to the elimination of the property tax in 10 years. But yet you have seen zero traction on any of those issues. So number one, it's immoral. It must go. And number two, there are plenty of plans out there to replace the property tax and not institute a state income tax and not hike up the sales tax. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of ways to collect that revenue and distribute it in a responsible way that is consistent with conservative financial principles. Uh, so moving on before we have to, to wrap up here, uh, looking at the campaign itself, um, you know, there's a number of candidates in the race, obviously the incumbent, Dan Patrick's. Pretty well funded. Has, I mean, is he is he still here? Yeah. I mean, I, no, no one's seen him, right? Uh, has the endorsement of, of former President Trump. H how do you go up against that? Well, you go up against it uh, quite quite simply, and this is what I said when when we launched the campaign. Dan Patrick is not running against me. Dan Patrick has to run against Dan Patrick, mm -hmm. right? All we have to do in our campaign is number one, engage the people that we've already engaged through the Texas Nationalist Movement, right? That's a half million strong, mm -hmm. um, and doing that by itself is enough with all the candidates in the race to force Dan Patrick in a runoff. But more than that, what we have seen is this massive anti-incumbent sentiment that are fed up with the substitution of principles for political expediency. Conservative voters and Texas voters in general are extremely upset 
at both Abbott and Patrick and frankly, pretty much anyone that's got an I beside their name mm -hmm. and with, with every right to be so. So what it has been for us has been massive voter contact, spinning up our existing volunteer base, uh, engaging the voters that we already have as a voting block and making sure that we have a very active get out the vote. So b bottom line is, is that the fact that Patrick had to pay money to have Trump come in to do a rally for him at the Montgomery County Fairgrounds tells you that Dan Patrick is in trouble. And and I, I firmly believe that we get Dan Patrick in a runoff, uh, we beat him, and then we go head to head. I, I look, I, hopefully Michelle Beckley makes it out of the Democrats <laughs> because I want to debate her so badly. <laughs> <laughs> um, last uh, question before we go here. If folks want to follow along with your campaign or get involved, where can they go do that? Absolutely. Uh, people could go check us out at TexansForMiller.com. TexansForMiller.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you. You made it to the end of this video. You're probably one in a million. But since you're here, make sure you go to texasscorecard.com to find more journalism and commentary, all things pertaining to Texas. Make sure you also like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and hit the bell. That way you can be notified when new videos come out. Thanks.